Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Depending on where you are logging in from, we want to welcome you to our APLOS educational webinar called The Science and Art of Donor Retention. Uh, we want to welcome you. I know some people are still um, just getting settled in and logging on. Hello, Jessica. I know we already have somebody that popped right in there on the question box, so that is great. Um, so again, you are um, with the APLOS webinar series. This is an educational webinar we do once a month, along with a series of other webinars that we do weekly. But um, today's uh, kind of fun because we get to talk not so much about software, but more about fundraising strategies, which is my passion. Again, we want to welcome you. Uh, before we get going, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. We just want to, first of all, make sure that you can, in fact, hear my voice and see my screen. So if you could do me a favor and just maybe a couple of you could just kind of put in the question box right before you that you can, in fact, uh, see my screen and hear my voice and all that technology is working lovely. Great. Welcome, Anthony. Good to have you. Jewel. Nice. Great. Couple, uh, couple names on here that are familiar to me that uh, have attended some of our other webinars. Great, Jessica. Good. Welcome. Welcome. Good. All right. Well, that's uh, that's really good. A um, couple of housekeeping things. First of all, um, this is a you know moderately an interactive webinar in that we do want to um, allow you to ask questions along the way. Typically, what I will do is I will pause from time to time and I will look at the question box. Um, but certainly I will leave ample time at the end of the webinar for you to ask questions and make any other comments as well as leave my contact information. I also want to let you know that we are recording this webinar. So um, if this uh, if you find this to be interesting uh, content or you want to share this with somebody, um, you will get an email follow up from us uh, a couple days usually after the webinar. Um, with a link and a recording of this uh, webinar so or if you have to step out earlier or whatever so with that why don't we go ahead and just uh, dive right in and get going so we can make um, the best use of your time again my name is Dan Kimball I am a product specialist here at Aplos um, I've been with Aplos for a little bit over three years and I have the honor and pleasure to work um, in a number of areas at Aplos but one that I'm very passionate about is our donor management product um, I kind of came out of the nonprofit sector um, after about 20 years of doing fundraising, uh, doing what many of you do every day, which is an honorable cause, which is um, sharing your passion for the nonprofit or ministry or churches that you represent and um, giving people an opportunity to become involved through donations and um, all of that. So it's definitely an area of, of passion for me. Um, and then I, of course, now with Apples get to um, share some of what um, what I learned over the years as well as work in the software here at Aplos. So um, if you're new to Aplos, um, we welcome you. Um, this is a free webinar. You don't have to be an Aplos customer, but just know that we are a donor management software and an accounting software all in one. Our passion is nonprofits and churches and ministries out there. So um, if you're interested in more information about our software or our products on that side, certainly reach out. Again, I will leave my contact information um, when we're done. We're a fun team. Uh, we have a, a lot of fun together. You're looking here. I think this is our, our Christmas card photo from this past year. Um, and we are certainly passionate and appreciative of the work all of you do out there. Um, so with that, let's talk about the science and art um, of donor retention. Before we do that, I always uh, this is a, a favorite slide of mine. I've shared this in some of my other webinars, um, but just to kind of you know wet the whistle a little bit about the fundraising and and the film uh, what I call the philanthropic culture out there. Um, where does money come from? And so every year, the Giving USA produces uh, this pretty amazing report, breaks it down to a lot of detail. But just to kind of give you an idea of how much money is out there in terms of what people give to philanthropy, it's pretty big. So in 2017, there was over $400 billion, that's billion with a B, given to philanthropic causes throughout the United States. Um, and of course, they break down to a whole bunch of um, different types of nonprofits, um, church, uh, schools, uh, human interests, public, social, arts, culture, international, all sorts of things. But you can kind of see in this slide over on the right kind of the breakdown. But why I like to personally um, feature this slide and highlight this is if you look on the left, there's giving by individuals, which is 70%. 
what this says to me is that at the end of the day, there's a lot of big companies that give and you know, the perception is maybe it's the big foundations that are giving all the money and though they do, but at the end of the day, it's about individual people who are engaging in your nonprofits. So with that, let me kind of keep in mind as we move forward and talk about this idea of donor retention today, think about those individuals who you can be engaging more of um, in your nonprofits, churches, or ministries. So just kind of a, a way to get started. And, you know, and to talk a little bit about um, the art and science or the science and art of donor retention, just to kind of um, think about, you want to think differently. And so I'm kind of starting off because this is a, one of my um, – almost favorite times of year. I am a big baseball fan. Um, and so once the Super Bowl's over, then us, the, those of us that follow baseball know that spring training is right around the corner. So what, nothing better to start off with by talking a little bit about a baseball analogy. One of my favorite movies of all time is a money called a movie called Moneyball. You might recognize this clip, uh, the story of, of Billy Bean. And the reason why I show this is that there's a there's a fascinating scene in Moneyball in which a Billy Bean, who's played by Brad Pitt here, um, walks into a room of old time baseball scouts who for years and years and years were able to scout baseball players by going and looking at them. And they had a very certain and old school, very traditional way in which they found baseball players. This young guy, Billy Bean, walks into the room and says, it's not about looking at the players. It's all about metrics. It's all about being able to do calculations and and um, what they call cyber metrics. And um, it was a real game changer in the game of baseball. But it also created a very interesting tension point amongst the young kind of new way of looking at how to find good baseball players and the um, old school way of, of going out and what they called scouting. Now, you might think, why in the heck is this guy talking about baseball when I just want to learn about how to raise more money? Well, because I believe, just like in that movie, there is a true art and science in fundraising. So I kind of like that analogy um, of just saying that, yeah, there's, there's definitely people out there that kind of want to do the same thing the same way over and over and over. But what I'm saying is that there is definitely some metrics out there. There's there's some science to fundraising, meaning that if you have a database, you can pull reports, you can pull data. But there's also an art in fundraising and, and how you can, in a sense, kind of create your personality and get to know your donors. Because the, the donors and people that have or that are involved in your organization are unique to you and um, might be different to the next organization or the next church down the street. So keep in mind, as we go through this webinar, there's really no right or wrong uh, way to do things other than just keep an open mind. So with that, we want to talk about the, the science and art or the art and science of, of not only fundraising, but specifically of donor retention. So if you think the same old way, you're going to get the same old results. So keep uh, keep an open mind. There's a lot of great people out there. I'll, I will make reference to some of the people that I follow. Um, that have great ideas about how to do your donor retention. So what we're going to do today for a little while is we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is donor retention, what are some strategies to increase that donor retention. But just kind of as a way to um, kick things off, just know that uh, six out of ten donors um, who gave last year won't go, won't particularly give this year. That's a huge stat uh, statistic out there. Um, and what we want to do is look at strategies on how what you can do to kind of keep those donors coming back. And um, we'll also define donor retention a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about your monthly program. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, but before we do that, more than anything, let's talk a little bit about what is donor retention um, and why does it matter? So I'm, donor retention is basically it's a fundraising method um, that, that allows you to, to uh, get gifts from existing donors. These can be regular, monthly, annual donors. Uh, they come in all forms of what we call retained donors, meaning that when somebody gives a gift to your nonprofit, what tools do you have in place? What strategies do you have in place to ensure that that person will make a second gift and a third gift and come back to you over and over and over? And it's a pretty big deal in the nonprofit world. In fact, I would venture to say it's probably one of the most talked about things out there right now in terms of what can you be doing to retain those donors. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, one of the key words here, which is donor engagement. What are you doing to make sure you don't lose those donors? Are those donors not coming back for a specific reason? 
Uh, Mark Pittman is one of my favorite fundraising experts out there. I've um, listened to and read a lot of his stuff, and he says that the average nonprofit loses um, um, loses uh, seven out of ten donors every year. Um, that's a pretty big amount. I mean, but picture ten people that are involved in your organization, and seven of those who you might never hear from again. Um, again, these are some averages. Some of you might be doing better or worse. But the point being is that there's a lot of data out there about this whole idea about what can we do to keep those donors engaged in your organization. I know another way to look at this is for every $100 a charity raised uh, from new donors in 2015, it lost 91 from existing donors. Um, so there's this kind of cycle of going out, finding new donors, and um, and and what are we doing to keep those donors? Uh, this fundraising effectiveness project, also known as FEP, is a great resource. Um, obviously, I have it quoted here on the slide, so you might want to Google that, check it out. It's a it's a very powerful report. Um, a last point on this is a well-run organization uh, that focuses on holding on to donors should have a um, first-year retention rate of around 40 to 45 percent and a multiple multiple year retention rate of 75 to 85 percent. Uh, this is according to the retention fundraising expert, uh, Roger Craver. Um, so the idea being here is that if you make um, your donors a priority in keeping them, you're gonna see them coming back uh, more and more down the road. So what we're, we're doing here is we're talking about retention versus acquisition. We're going to focus on what we call the donor funnel. The donor funnel is that you have all these different touch points with people within your organization. It might be a volunteer. It might be a board member. It might be somebody who's come to an event. It might be somebody that wrote a gift. It might be somebody that just came to your church for the first time. You have all these different forms of people that are coming to you. And what unfortunately a lot of people do is they spend so much time and money on how do we get new people? How do we grow our, our donor list? How do we um, how do we buy a list? Um, we have people that call here at Apples and say, can you help me find donors? And a lot of times my response is, well, you've got donors right there in your list. Are you doing the work needed to keep those donors? So what we're doing here is what are we going to do to fix that leaky bucket? In other words, as people are dropping off, are you spending as much time uh, retaining them as you are acquiring new folks? So that's what really donor retention is like. Our good friends over at Bloomerang do a lot of great work in this area. Bloomerang is a donor management product, um, also a partner of Apple's. And they do a, a, a exceptional work in this area in talking about um, why does it even matter? Well, if you look at some of these slides, um, you can see that um, that re re donor retention does matter because if, if in, in the nonprofit world, uh, if retention is 41 percent, that's a lot of people that your nonprofits are losing um, that might be giving somewhere else for a variety of reasons. So these are some real helpful slides and um, I think some helpful, helpful demographics about that. What's interesting, and we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail, is this is this idea that new donor retention is about uh, 27%, whereas repeat donor retention is 70%. So what that means, to kind of help you break that down a little bit, is that if you can get a second or a third gift, or what we call a recurring gift from a donor, and your softwares, a lot of your softwares will allow you to do that. And I just want to highlight, if you are using an online giving form that does not allow reoccurring giving, you might want to explore something new. So I, I think, I know a lot of people use PayPal. Um, here at Applos, we have a, a great online form uh, with WePay. Uh, and I know there's others out there, but I'd really encourage you to look into that. Because if you can get folks kind of locked in making regular commitments, whether that's monthly, quarterly, annually, your um, your retention rates are going to go up. So that's just kind of an interesting little little point. So there lies the question: Why focus on retention? Why not just do what we're doing and go out and find new people and 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 grow your list? Well, first and probably the most obvious is it definitely costs more to acquire new donors than it is to keep them. Um, in other words, if you have to advertise, if you have to go to like Google or Facebook, or and you're paying for advertising in order to get attention to your nonprofit. Um, that's going to be more expensive than simply sending uh, good follow-up and engagement pieces to your existing donors. But also remember that people don't just donate to your nonprofit. 
Um, they also, they're volunteers. They serve on your boards. They spread the word about your organizations to friend and family. If you look at even the power of social media in this day and age, if you can get somebody to, to, to retweet or share on, on Instagram a photo um, or even fundraise on your behalf on Facebook, you, you've got those donors right there. Um, you're not having to buy or look for new people. So they're not just donors, but they, they also participate in other activities that can benefit you just as much. And believe it or not, some of those are also your new potential donors. Uh, I have a whole other webinar I've done on how do you get volunteers, how do you convert volunteers into good donors? A lot of people think, well, they're volunteering, so they can't be donors. Well, that's actually not true. So the point being here is they're not just donating, they're getting involved. And so there's um, there's a, um, a nuggets of, of huge wealth right there. Um, and I mean not just money wealth, but just um, those advocates for your nonprofit. Donors rarely give twice if they don't feel, uh, feel aptly appreciated, meaning that um, just simple things like thank you notes and follow-ups and, and receptions and touch points become a really, really big deal. So not only will strong relationships improve your donor retention, uh, but our giving trends will indicate that donors who give more than once tend to increase their donations over time, meaning it becomes a habit. It just goes from something that felt good to something that really matters to them. It becomes important. So this means that your organization will likely raise more money from existing donors than it would from first-time donors. So as you can see, it's, it's all um, a pretty... Uh, pretty important and um, big deal here. Again, I mentioned this before. It's such a big deal that uh, AFP uh, and the Urban Institute, uh, uh, along with a couple of others, created, I think Blackbaud Razor's Edge is involved in this, um, created the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. If you're kind of a numbers nerd, you want to get into the science of fundraising, I encourage you to um, check out that resource and um, look at some of the um, just the statistical and, and information and just even just to see where your organization uh, sits with some of the information that's out there about, um, you know, different donor retention rates and how do you calculate those rates and all of that. So that's the kind of the sciencey side of donor uh, retention. What I want to do now is talk about the art, though. Um, and the art is just kind of getting a sense. Well, this this could be the science side, too, because these are some statistics. But um, there's some great information about why do donor why do nonprofits donors leave in the first place? Um, this came out a couple of years ago, uh, somewhat still accurate, I think. Uh, this particular survey said that five percent thought the charity did not need them. 8% no info on how monies were used. This is a really big deal. They said, um, hey, thanks for the gift. That was it. Never heard from them again. Uh, 9%, uh, they, <laughs> this is funny to me. I don't know why, but 9%, they had no memory of supporting. Uh, you know, who knows? They got a thing in the mail. Maybe a spouse gave. 13% never got thanked for donating. This is a really, really big deal. And I would encourage you. And I would even venture to say, even if you are a church, um, I would really encourage you to have a discussion about how are you thanking those donors. 16% uh, was due to death. Um, uh, 18% poor service or communication. 36% uh, said others are more deserving. That's a pretty big statistic, which means that maybe folks need to do a better job telling their story or letting people know how those dollars are being used. And then I thought that was interesting that 54% could no longer afford Wish I had a little more info on that, but I did find this to be an interesting um, piece of um, data on this particular area. Okay, so let's talk about some strategies a little bit to boost that donor retention. What are some things that you can be doing now? So if you've ever been on a webinar with me, you know I, I like to talk about what folks are doing out there, but I really like hopefully the walk away will be one or two things that you can have that are practical applications for your nonprofit or your ministry. So um, uh, so some, some, so here are some key components of donor commitment, um, how a donor perceives your organization to be effective in trying to achieve its mission. This becomes an important uh, part of that donor process. Um, so how they perceive your organization and, and do they see you to be effective um, in what it is that you say you do. Um, donors uh, know what to expect from your organization with each interaction. In other words, they know you're um, they know they might get a thank you. They um, they know how you work and operate. So, again, we're kind of building a relationship 
between you and the donor. Um, donors receives a timely thank you. Um, I, I cannot emphasize, emphasize this enough. Uh, for me personally, I like to um, just, uh, again, as a test, um, what I will usually do is, is towards the end of the year, usually about November, December, I'll, I will usually donate to about five or six, sometimes a few more different charities. It's not a huge amount, just to kind of see how different folks out there are thinking. Um, in fact, just as a funny story, I gave to one organization in November, and I actually got two additional appeal letters before I ever got a thank you. In other words, they asked me for more money two different times before I ever got thanked. So to me, that's a systems problem internally um, or something kind of was amiss there. So for me, that as a donor, that was a bit of a turnoff. So think about your, your thank you process, how and who you're thanking. Donor receives opportunities to make his or uh, her uh, views known. In other words, they have a chance to have some feedback with your organization, uh, doing things like donor surveys, things like that. Um, the donor's given the feeling that he or she is part of an important cause. So if you can bring people in the fold and help them really think that they are, they themselves are making a difference, that will increase uh, donor commitment. A donor feels his or her involvement is appreciated. They feel thanked, they feel valued. And then lastly, a donor receives information showing who is being helped. Um, again, you don't have to have thousands of dollars to do this, especially in this day and age of social media and um, easy to uh, get back to donors. Uh, but these are things that um, I think will really help uh, you uh, identify good donors for retention. So here's some simple strategies to boost that donor retention. Um, again, I'm going to uh, kind of go over this a lot, but think quickly and personally. Um, a bland, dear friend type of thank you probably won't work as effectively as a, you know, filling in somebody's first name and then how much they gave and what they gave to and all of that. I say go overboard with appreciation and use those donor centric tones. Donor centric is, uh, this was a, a really big deal. Uh, about five or six years ago, there was a, a number of resources that came out called donor-centered fundraising. The idea is being as you talk more about the donors than you do about yourselves. We all know you're great, doing great work, and we all know that um, yeah, that that um, you're out there, but the donors want to know that they're part of that story. And then you want to tell how those gifts are being or are going to be used. Um, storytelling becomes a really big deal here. And how are you sharing the stories of your donors, gifts, and how are they making a difference? Um, so when you're communicating stuff and just saying, hey, thanks for your gift, and instead of saying, you know what, because of your gift, these things are happening right now. Children are being uh, fed. Um, students are being tutored, uh, you know, homeless are finding homes or whatever that cause is, you know, uh, that, that you're a part of, um, you know, and then tell them what comes next. Tell them what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's like, a, you know, watching a show that uh, you want to keep them excited for the next one. Um, ask for feedback from your donors. Again, giving them an opportunity to be a part. Uh, and that means maybe you not being so thin skinned, but as a nonprofit saying, yeah, maybe we could do things better by listening to our donors. And then lastly, get them involved and be creative. Um, I have in other webinars shared a series of uh, there's lots of good resources out there about uh, creative thank you strategies for those folks. OK, so let's just take a pause right here. It looks like we're all good on our questions. So I'm going to keep uh, kind of plowing array. So the next kind of area I want to talk about is, is, is sort of the practical of, of one of the, I think, key strategies is having a good stewardship plan within your organization. Um, stewardship for me is not just something that um, uh, you, you, know, you just say, oh, yeah, we do stewardship. But stewardship is actually a strategy. And according to Case Sprinkle Grace, uh, stewardship is the most neglected aspect of the, of the giving process. Um, and, believe, and her belief is that's why we don't have more major donors. In other words, stewarding a donor is what nonprofit organizations do or should be doing from the time of the first gift and lasting until that donor no longer has a relationship with the organization. So, again, from the minute that first gift comes in from that donor, thinking about um, the, what we call the, you know, the, the life of the gift, uh, you know, not just making sure it gets processed and a receipt goes out, 
but the touch points that are going back to the donor. So I, I like Case for Grace, believe that stewardship truly is at the core of a good fundraising strategy. Just like you have maybe an annual budget, you might have a fundraising plan. You should have a stewardship plan. A stewardship plan and a strategy can be its own um, its own device in which you're um, how you're reaching out to various donors. It shows the donors um, that the organization uh, it shows those donors how how you've entrusted their money um, and you appreciate their gifts. Many donors, uh, many nonprofits lose donors over time, uh, or donors do not increase their giving because the stewardship is not a priority. Some people believe that stewardship means you need to flood donors with gifts like pens and magnets and calendars and those kinds of trinkets. And I, and I don't believe that's what we're talking about. Donor stewardship is, is more than anything communicating how their dollars are being used and the difference that those dollars are making uh, for you as a nonprofit. OK. So what happens when donor stewardship is not a priority? Well, most most would agree that donors will become less engaged, just like we talked about a little bit already. Uh, donors are sometimes not sure that their money is even making a difference. They might think, well, what what does my twenty five dollars even matter? Um, they might forget about you um, if they're not hearing from you. Uh, they'll lose interest. Uh, they maybe they lose trust a little bit because again, they not sure uh, all that's happening. Uh, they don't feel valued, and then donors might decide to give elsewhere. Keep in mind that the average donor gives between uh, two, between three and five different organizations, um, and so you're not the only one on the block that they might be giving to. So with that, you want to make sure that you're kind of staying on that radar as much as you can. At the same time, you don't want to over flood them to where they go, my gosh, I'm sick of hearing from you. So it's finding that that balance. That's why that stewardship plan, having a written out um, and a good stewardship plan about the different types of donors, first time donors. Uh, you want to send a different kind of communication to a first time donor than you do, say, an engaged donor who's giving the same amount every month and has been for the last three years. Um, even little things like new donor welcome packets or phone calls to new donors. And then with those engaged donors, keeping the message uh, changing so they're not getting the same boring letter month after month. So here's a great question. What are you stewarding? Are you stewarding the gift or are you stewarding the donor? And so for a long time, I think that donor, donor stewardship um, really became about you know, the responsibility you had as an organization to um, invest those dollars wisely and and show good accountability. And those are all really, really good and should be done, because as we all know, we've heard, unfortunately, those stories of organizations where maybe money wasn't being used wisely. But I think um, really in the, uh, the, the tides have shift. It goes back to this kind of new kind of art kind of feeling of donor stewardship is really going into a combination of both stewardship and donor relations, which is care and nurturing of both the gift and the donor. You're not only making sure that when somebody gives you uh, money that you're entrusting that and investing it well, but you're communicating back and you're taking care of that donor as an investor. Uh, and that's what donors are. They are an investor in your, whether it's a church, whether it's a nonprofit, whatever, they're investing in, in, in you and they're trusting you. So you want to be thinking that, about that as you develop your stewardship plans. So a goal with a stewardship plan is develop a stewardship program with focus on creating happy donors whose commitment and giving increases throughout their lifetimes. Again, you want to acknowledge uh, donors, acknowledge, uh, ensure appropriate acknowledgement of all gifts. This is not just the January end of the year tax statement. Uh, this is uh, this is more personalized thank yous, follow ups. And again, messaging of how those donations are being used for your mission and cause. Um, you want to determine levels of personal acknowledgments from leadership and participants within your organization. What this means, for example, if you maybe you're a little bit of a larger, what you really actually you don't have to be even larger. Let's say, for example, you might have um, some gifts that are acknowledged by staff, some gifts that are acknowledged by, say, the, the executive director or CEO of the company. Um, but you might want to have different levels of how people are thanked and who's thanking them. Um, not because one is more important than the other, because then what it does, it sort of kind of mixes it up a little bit. And then you want to determine how you will communicate. Um, 
um, things like video messages from leadership, participants, volunteers. Um, I helped a nonprofit one time um, develop a strategy, and what they just simply did is about twice a year we would uh, gather up volunteers um, who were participants in that program, and they would then pick up the phone and they would do phone calls to donors. They would just simply call and say, I'm a participant in this program and I just wanted to say thank you for, for your donations. Um, and it was a really powerful and effective strategy from that aspect. Um, you want to recognize giving at various levels. Um, so not just the big donors or not just, you know, one type of donor, but you want to have different types of, of, of follow-ups for different levels of giving. Um, you want to communicate to donors through various mediums or methods. So not just thank yous, but also things like newsletters, um, holiday and birthday congratulation cards. You can, uh, using good software, you can indicate who's got upcoming dates and birthdays and anniversaries and things like that. As you can see, different channels, we call them, which would be uh, email, uh, impact stories. Um, some people use honor rolls, social media, um, and good old-fashioned snail mail still works if you have a donor base that's older that still appreciates a, a nice letter. So don't just do one thing the same way all the time, but, may, but maybe mix it up a little bit. Also, invitations to various events, press conferences. Would, for example, if you have a major announcement or you have the opportunity to have the press come to your uh, to your nonprofit for some reason, hopefully a positive reason, get those donors there. Um, have stories of impact through feature stories on those donors uh, in your website, email, and newsletters. Also provide annual impact report of the impact of their gift and overall fundraising. Um, just kind of as a, a note here, I want to say this is the time of year where a lot of folks are doing annual reports. Annual reports are wonderful, but I think that sometimes people spend way too much money on glossy colored graphs and charts and, and this, that, and the other, and they never really talk about impact. Um, and so I would say if you do do an annual report, um, think about how you can tell a better story on the impact that happens. Um, I want to pause right here because we do have a, a, a comment or a question from Anthony, uh, which is our focus group has shown that donors feel that uh, key change and little gifts are not a significant factor for them to donate and they feel it was a waste of money. Well, that's a great comment, Anthony. And I also want to mention, Anthony, first of all, I want to congratulate you for even taking the, the time and effort to survey your donors. I think that is an excellent practice and great feedback. I think there's an appropriate place for little, for little promotion items. Um, and so I don't mean to say that you should never do them. I think there's, there's a time and a place for that. But I think as a, as a focus point to say thank you, I think donors really want to hear stories more than they want a keychain. So great point, and I appreciate your, your uh, input on that, Anthony. And then uh, specific stewardship plans for your largest donors are necessary. And I know people struggle with this a little bit because they think, well, all donors should be treated equally. Well, yes and no. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is all donors should be thanked and all donors should be communicated to. But if you have someone making a large investment in your organization, um, you know, of 100K, 10,000, 10, 500K, you need to have a plan for that. How are they being thanked? How are they being recognized? Um, some people, that might mean, you know, a, a naming of a, of a room or um, in some cases, a reception of some kind. It's okay to uh, to target um, and think about how you want to thank uh, different various levels of donors and not apologize for that, okay? So let's talk about monthly donor programs a little bit and how your monthly uh, giving program affects donor retention. We talked this about this a little bit. Again, this is a slide from our friends at Bloomerang, um, which is – if you see here, your first time donor retention is about 19%, where your repeat donor retention is 63%. Um, monthly donors are much more loyal um, in the long run. So again, in this day and age where you have the opportunity for people to give on a reoccurring basis, uh, and whether that's an online environment or any kind of monthly giving program, we show over and over and over the data will support that monthly donor programs are going to in the long run, um, gain more donors. If I said to you, what would you rather have? Would you rather have um, three gifts of $10,000 or would you rather have 100 donors that give every month the same amount for three years? 
most people hopefully will pick door number two, um, knowing that that one-time gift could quickly go away if they don't ever come back. Okay, so why is monthly giving so important as a, re a donor retention strategy? Well, first of all, it's a steady and predictable source of income. You know it's going to be there every month. Um, there's no end date in most times unless it's a pledge. Small donations are significant, significant gifts in disguise, meaning they can really add up over time. Um, smaller donors might say, smaller donation donors might say, hey, well, you know, this might not make much of a difference, but over time it really can. Um, recruiting month or do monthly donors is inexpensive, meaning that with online strategies, social media, those kinds of things, it shouldn't cost you very much other than in some cases a very small maybe transaction fee, which the donors in this day and age can actually pay for. Again, utilizing good online donation forms for that. And it's easy processing and tracking um, as well. So um, it's an important and a very um, effective strategy. With that, let's talk about focus on gifts no matter what size. Uh, many large donors really do start at a small level. In other words, uh, they might start small and over time if they continue to give, hopefully that donor progression begins to happen. They'll give a larger gift, maybe a more significant gift. They'll give to a campaign or something like that. So you might have many of these everyday donors that already uh, you could already uh, be nurturing into long-term supporters or larger donors. But I want to emphasize, if you're not taking the time to show your appreciation to them, you'll likely lose that opportunity. At the end of the day, when we talked about that graph at the very beginning about those $410 billion, a lot of times these are large, large gifts that were nurtured over time through stewardship, through monthly giving, uh, through appreciation events, and those kinds of things. As a nonprofit, you need to look at each small donation as an entry point, a window into and long into a long-term relationship uh, with that donor um, and could and hopefully will return many dividends in the form of a lifetime and giving uh, um, access to the donor's network. So it's like an investment, right? You, most people don't invest in something to expect a return overnight. Um, they invest and, and hopefully over time that pays off. Well, they're doing the same thing with your nonprofit. So really want to make sure you don't um, – disregard those small gifts of, well, we really don't have um, the money to send thank yous to so many small donors. And that might be a, um, a mistake. Smaller donations should be viewed as opportunities, not burdens. Um, boy, I sure hope you're looking at gifts and not going, oh gosh, I have to do my thank yous again or something like that. Um, it's great that these donors gave what they did. Uh, they're supporting your nonprofit. And now have added the connection, and um, they're a new member of your nonprofit. They're part of your community, okay? This is a great resource. Uh, agentsofgood.org is a, is, a, is a fun resource out there. Um, there's a lot of material on what they call donor love. Um, there's, there's various and a variety of versions of it, uh, but I do like the seven principles of donor love that I'd like to just kind of highlight. Um, and um, again, you can go to agentsofgood.org and, and get more. Again, some of the folks that I already mentioned um, talk about this. Tom Ahern talks about it. A um, couple others that I'll leave you at the end. Um, the first is your donors are heroes. Again, this is getting away from the you and more about the them, more about the donors and how you're treating and how you're um, involving donors into your nonprofit. Make your donors the heroes. They're the ones that are the superstars. Um, you know, I think having a picture of, of a bunch of staff, you know, doing the work is great. I think having donors part of that story is even better. Uh, make sure that you are sharing amazing, inspiring stories. Um, again, um, fo photos mean a million, you know, uh, can, can just mean the world. Um, there's a nonprofit that I refer to a lot of in my webinars called Charity Water. You can just go to charitywater.org. Um, they do a phenomenal job in terms of sharing amazing, um, powerful images with very, very little words. Um, and so that can you can learn a lot from them. You connect to your donors' uh, values and emotions. Um, they say that in seven principles of donor love, donor love is a courtship. It's a romance. Um, how do you make your donors fall? 
and then stay in love with you. I mean, just like a relationship, right, over time, uh, you don't want that relationship to be stagnant. So you have to do different things to spice things up, <laughs> if, if, I, if you will. Um, and the same is true with those donors. And that's why don't send them those the same thing over and over and over. If you become too predictable, um, you want to kind of keep them, uh, you know, wanting more and wanting more attention from you. You ask for one thing and only one thing. Now, this one is interesting because what this kind of talks about is really more sometimes people overwhelm donors with choices. Like if you send them, a, you know, a, let's say a communication piece and, and they need to check one of 15 boxes of where to get involved, it can become overwhelming. But if you can narrow your message um, to one thing, um, the chances are you'll likely get uh, get more uh, engagement and involvement. And that one thing can change. But don't overwhelm donors with too many things. Who or, right, who or what is the right voice for your story? And that can change. Um, you know, I know that many executive directors are passionate about the work they do, but quite frankly, sometimes they're not always the best spokespersons. Um, maybe you want to have more donors involved or um, uh, maybe um, a recipient of the services received, those kinds of things. Um, and again, make sure that in your thank you, you're saying thank you with passion. Um, and there's there's lots of resources out there for um, good thank you letters and effective thank you letters and all of that. I'm not going to read these quotes, but I'll just kind of put them up here for a minute for a couple of minutes um, as we kind of wind down. Um, and um, just kind of these are some some what I call leading influencers in the fundraising field. These are just a few people, folks that I like to follow on on Twitter and. Uh, various forms of social media. These are um, uh, authors and, and they all have some great quotes here about donor retention. So again, I'm going to leave that up for a minute. Um, and um, as we kind of wind down, we are going to um, start good into our time of question and answer um, here in a minute. So um, with that, I'm going to go right here. So with that, that's, uh, that's kind of um, all I have on the donor retention side of things. So at this point, I'd like to, um, if any of you would like to jump in and ask a question, make a comment, uh, emphasize anything that I went over, would love to. Again, um, this is a recorded webinar. You'll have access to the slides, uh, information shared, uh, and um, anything else. So with that, would love, uh, love any feedback you have and any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to do that. Um, Somebody's asking about the stewardship plan, um, and again, just to kind of emphasize on the, on the stewardship plan, what is a stewardship plan? It can be a written plan. It can be, um, you know, a strategy. Um, again, a lot of nonprofits will actually have the same kind of stewardship plan as they do a fundraising strategy plan. It's it's basically listing out how you're going to thank your donors and the various donor levels um, with that. Okay. Great. So it does not look like we have any other questions. Okay. Do you have a, yep. Do you have a webinar on how to appeal for first time donors? Anthony, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think we have, um, I don't think we have a first time donor specific webinar per se. That's actually a really good idea. Um, makes me think about, um, so I think, um, yeah, unfortunately we don't. I mean, I think, I think, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Great question though. Make me thinking a little bit here. That was a great presentation. Is there another webinar to show how Aplos subscriber can set up reoccurring donations on the service? Yeah, if you go to Aplos.com and we have a resource center, if you go to our, our support center, we have a list of webinars. One of those on there is, um, and we have some resources on our online donation form. If that's, if I'm, answer, Lori, if I'm answering your question, um, we use WePay as our credit card processing provider. So if, um, or you can give us a call here. In fact, let me just go ahead and pop um, pop my contact information. Here's my email if you want to follow up with me or go to aplos.com uh, for that. Uh, what are some of the most important questions to be asking when putting out a survey? That's a really, really good question. Um, and and I think I think first of all, um, I think uh, one is is um, just asking them, are they you know currently happy with, um, the type of things that they're getting from you. So, for example, do we do we contact you too much? Do you want to hear more from us? 
Um, uh, I think things like, do you understand the work we do? Trying to, um, trying to get a sense of your messaging, I think is another good question. Um, do you know what we do? Do you know who to contact if you had a question? Do you know our phone number? Do you know our website? Have you looked at our social media page? I think those would be good ones. Um, you know, uh, maybe things about what would inspire them to give more or give again. Good question. Really, really good. Uh, will this whole webinar be available listening? Miss the first half. Yes, Cheryl. Uh, this is webinar is being recorded. Um, as long as you're registered here, you'll get a follow up email with a link uh, giving you um, a recording of this webinar and um, all that I shared. How do you go about rebuilding donor relationships with donors who have lapsed? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, there's two ways to do it. Strategically, first of all, make sure you know how to run reports in your system. Uh, we There's two fundraising reports. One is called a Libunt. Another is called a Cybunt. A Libunt is somebody who gave last year, but unfortunately not this year. A Cybunt is somebody who gave some year, but not this year. Uh, that's, that's, that's the science part of it, meaning know how to run that report. I think, first of all, just reaching out in kind of a we missed you letter. Um, that would be one strategy. Another strategy is if you have the resources or the people, I get out there and start meeting with people. Um, I think it's very much okay to say, hey, I'm with this organization. I know you once gave. I'd love to come and meet with you or talk to you and hear a little bit more about your, you know, your experience with us. Or I've got a great story to tell you about the work we're doing. I think be honest with people. I think it's okay to say, hey, we're sorry we, we haven't been connecting with you or something in that regard. But I would, um, first of all, know, know who's giving, when they're giving. Or let me rephrase that. Know who those lapsed donors are and then figure out a strategy. You know, Now, are they mad at the organization? Maybe that requires a different kind of uh, conversation than just people that just got giving, that kind of thing. Make sure your records are up to date. One of the great uh, failures – with nonprofits is they just don't keep records updated. So they get a bounced email, a bad address, somebody's moved, they haven't updated their database. So I would say that was a lot of reason um, on that. So what ex to what extent does social media play in retention? I think social media plays a huge in terms of a, a huge role in terms of the kinds of stories that you can tell and the kind of communications that you can give your donors. Um, and so I think, um, uh, so one on, on the communication side of social media, I think there's huge opportunities, uh, just to tell stories and, 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 and get something out there that doesn't look like everybody else's from a, from a, an actual fundraising standpoint. One is that one social media is a fundraising tool now, and I think you can use it to, to ask people to donate to your nonprofit or donate on behalf of your nonprofit. Um, and, and Mar Marianne, I hope I answered that question to the extent enough. If I haven't, please, please pipe in there again. Uh, Angie, I think your name is, uh, Facebook fundraisers tend to get one-time donors and they are not easy to connect with if, uh, if not in your friend's network. Any suggestions, uh, for how to improve contact with these donors? Um, you know, uh, for me, I, I personally am not as, um, Facebook savvy anymore. That's just kind of for me personally. I, I've been finding Facebook to become very, very noisy and cluttered with a lot of stuff. Um, I think Facebook is great for messaging. For me, I'm always going to say what's in your database. Uh, so if your nonprofit is using a database, I think one for one thing, if you can recognize how people came to your nonprofit. So if you can figure out that you had donors that came through Facebook then you might want to reach back out to them with a personalized message on Facebook or on social media. So in other words, if, if they came to you through Facebook, then you know that they they like that medium. So then you want to communicate back out to them that way. Um, I do think that um, it is hard if you're just, uh, you know, people are inundating their friends and their Facebook network to raise money. So I think uh, more than anything, utilizing the medium to tell stories. What about uh, what about the worth of fundraising dinners, uh, contests, et cetera? Uh, what about the worth? Well, for those kinds of things, it's always about the cost of fundraising uh, more than anything. So I think they are a valuable resource if they have a good strategy uh, and um, you're not just doing them just to, because the next guy is. So 
contests. Uh, I'm not sure what a contest, Rob, in your mind is, but if you're referring to like like uh, raffles and you know those kinds of things, I know my community. There's a couple of, of um, house auctions, not auctions. Let me rephrase that. You buy a raffle ticket and you can win a house, uh, and the money goes to charity. Those kinds of things. I think they're good. Um, uh, you know, I've been a, a part of fundraising dinners. Um, they're a lot of work. They're a lot of staff time. They're very draining. Uh, however, they can also be a great way to um, introduce the organization to new people and a comfortable way for people to invite friends. So I would say, one, look at your budget, look at your fundraising goals, and then more than anything, what do you want to accomplish besides raising money at that dinner? So that's how I would probably approach that. Um, yeah. What are a few of the first steps in establishing a donor acknowledgement? Um, a first step is I would ask, what are you currently doing? Uh, uh, currently, are you thanking donors at all? If not, first step is going to be, what's my, what's my process internally? In other words, when a check or an online gift gets made to your nonprofit, what's the process? Who, who deposits it, deposits the money? Who, um, who's in charge of running a report? who's in charge of writing thank yous and what thank you is being done. So look at what you currently have um, and then move from there. Again, a lot of softwares, including Applos, provides tools to where you can have a nice letter already done or some kind of online acknowledgement tool so, so that you can make sure that somebody gets thanked within a short amount of time. Um, what are some strategies to tap into current donors network? Current donors network, uh, Tara. So I, if, if in other words, if you're asking for current donors um, to, to your organization to share their network with you, um, I think in that case, um, it's a matter of getting to know those donors. I think one way is uh, through what they call crowdfunding, meaning asking people to donate on your behalf is a great tool. One of the new trends I'm seeing out there, which I think is really great, is people will say, hey, this year for my birthday, uh, instead of giving gifts, I'm asking for you to make a donation to my favorite charity, XYZ. And then what they'll do is they'll do a two-week fundraiser through like kind of a GoFundMe kind of idea, but they'll raise money for your organization. So if you can get people out there kind of wearing, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, wearing your hat, uh, you know, championing your nonprofit out there, that could go a long ways. Okay. Um, is good grant is good grant is is grant writing a good way to raise funds? It is a good way to raise funds, but grants can be very time consuming. Um, and my only fear of grants is that sometimes the when the money runs out, is it sustainable? So um, if you have the resources to write grants, yes, they're good. But obviously, you're not getting that um, that the same donor connection over time. Um, I've been on the grant writing side. It's it um, there's a lot of money out there, uh, but they can all. It's also very competitive. There's more nonprofits asking for money than there are people granting money. So I would say if it's one of many strategies, they're awesome. Uh, what is your opinion about collaborative fundraising? Uh, I'm a huge believer in collaborative fundraising. If you can uh, work with other nonprofits in your community uh, on a on a joint fundraising project where you share the revenue, I think it's awesome. Uh, but you just have to be very clear with each other what the expectations are so that one organization doesn't feel like they're doing all the work, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think um, I'm a huge believer in collaborative fundraising. Um, great. You're very welcome, Rob. Uh, what kind of details should we be giving donors to keep them in the loop? I think the, the number one most important detail is how their money's being used. Um, it, it, what impact is being made because they give? In other words, I always like to ask people, um, ask yourself this question. What, what would your community look like if your nonprofit did not exist? That's a great way to start a letter. Um, so I think more than anything, what donors want to know is that they're making a difference, that something good is happening. And in this day and age where there's so much negativity in the news uh, and, 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 and all the, you know, with the government shut down right now and all that, I think people are looking for, for something positive. So if you can shine out um, ahead of that and say, look, look what's happening because you chose to give to us, I think you're going to go a long ways. Those are excellent questions, everybody. 
Again, my uh, contact information is right here. So if you do would like to do a follow up, if you want any information about uh, more about Aplos or more just want to chat with me, please feel free to reach out. Uh, if you're on Twitter, love to hear from you there or just send me an email. Um, really appreciate all of you and your time taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for an Aplos webinar. Um, again, you can go to our website for more information about upcoming or past recorded webinars. Um, really great questions and I appreciate the uh, involvement. Hopefully this is uh, something that I shared today that will be uh, helpful for you as you work with your nonprofits and your donors and, and uh, hopefully retaining those donors uh, for more success down the road. So with that, uh, there's no more questions. I want to wish you all a very happy 2019, and I hope to uh, see you at another one of our another webinars. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.